everybody, Linda aka The Gamer Girl here, and this is the Glitchy Gamer Podcast, the podcast that glitches onto the channel every now and then. Today I have a special guest with me, David J. Felding. You might know him, he's been on your TV for many, many years. He is the original Zordon. Hello David, thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast, Linda, it's great to be here. So David, we got to hear some of the cast members beforehand talk about their experiencing with the audition, how they heard about the show. Can we get some like general like feedback on how your audition process was, what it was like hearing from maybe your agent or your manager about the show and what happened throughout that whole process? Sure. Um, I had just moved to Los Angeles. I had only been there for about two months and I didn't have an agent yet. I hadn't been on many auditions. Uh, I had moved out there to see uh, if I could make it in the industry like so many people do every year. Um, and uh, luckily I had gone to my undergraduate school uh, with a friend of mine named Stacy Fish who was working at Saban at the time, uh, uh, working on their uh, straight to video movies and stuff that they were doing. But she was also working as an assistant DA, uh, di uh, assistant director on this kids television pilot that they were working on okay. and she called me up and said hey would you like to come down and audition for this part i think you'd be really great for it <clears throat> and since i had just moved there and i thought well sure why not i mean that's that's why i'm here and uh i had thought that it was going to be just like any other cattle call that i would go down there would be a thousand other guys there i would go into a room read my lines in front of a camera and then go home and never hear anything again but um when I got down to the Saban building that afternoon, uh, they took me up to, I can't remember what floor it was, it was four or five, something like that, up in the, up in the building, and um, was very surprised to find out that it was just myself and another guy. And uh, they told us that they had planned on casting it that night and wanted to know if we were available to shoot the following week, and I said, well, of course, I'll make myself available if I get the part. Um, and then they handed us our sides and said, hey, uh, you're going to be reading for this part of the character of Zoltar, which was the character's name at the time. Uh -huh. And um, he's a 10,000-year-old wizard. He's trapped in a time warp. And they left. So that's all the information I had. And uh, so we both sort of separated to separate corners of the room, and I could hear him do, rehearsing his lines. And I looked at the, the lines, and they brought him into the room first, and he was gone for about 20 minutes. And then he came out and they brought me in and I, I met the director, the producers, uh, some of the studio heads. The, I met the original cast. They were all sitting on the front front row and they had me stand up on a table and uh, read the lines. And I had heard the, the other gentleman previously uh, who had been rehearsing and he had uh, a very different take on the character mm -hmm. than what I had. And he had, uh, he had pitched his voice up higher and it was very kind of um, kind of squeaky a little bit. And I thought, well, that really doesn't speak to me of, of a mentor type character. So I, I went the opposite direction. I went very deep. And I ended up using the voice that um, pretty much is the same voice that I ended up using in the show. And after I had read through the main monologue, um, I remember Austin St. John turning to everybody and going, well, I think we found our Zoltar. And uh, I, I can thanked everybody and I went home and a couple of hours later I got the phone call and I got the job. So that's how nice. that went. How was it like working with the actor who played Alpha and all the other people? Like, were you on the side somewhere when you were reading your lines or did you actually, were you on a camera somewhere watching their reactions to you? Well, that's the thing. I mean, it was, it was really uh, awesome to get, you know, cause the following week I went in and we filmed the character's part and, they shaved all my hair off, and uh, uh, and then they said, we'll call you if the show gets picked up. And uh, that's sort of like a, a line that you hear a lot because they filmed so many different pilots out in L.A. So I thought, well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. And I was very pleasantly surprised to get a phone call like three weeks later saying, congratulations, the show was picked up. Uh, you know, we'll have a schedule out to you as far as like, you know, what we're going to do with your character. And I said, great, when do I show up on set? And they told me, oh, well, we're not going to film you anymore. We're just going to bring you in to do voices. So uh, for the next uh, eight or nine months, uh, I never saw anybody else from the cast. Um, I was never on set with them. 
uh, I would just go into the recording booth like every five or six weeks to do whatever lines they had assigned to the character at the time. So there were a couple of times when I met Richard Horvitz, who was the voice of Alpha, and we recorded stuff together. But other than that, um, and, and I met Barbara Goodson, who was the voice of Rita, and yeah. Farragut Khan, who was the voice of Goldar, but we never really sort of worked together. I was always very, very much like Zordon. I was separated from everybody by this, this wall. And, um, uh, but it was a very uh, unique experience to be able to see how things worked from behind the scenes, um, getting to know the sound in engineers and getting to, a chance to work on some of the side projects that they were working on. But unfortunately, I, I, I didn't get to work with the cast, and I only met them again like 21, 22 years later when we did a convention together. So, I mean, uh, the, the magic of television uh, is always sort of... Uh, uh, a quilt, a patchwork quilt of how things are put together, and uh, it's always interesting to to see audiences react to the fact that <laughs> nobody was actually speaking to Zordon; they were speaking to a tennis ball that was pasted up on the wall. So, yeah, that's so that's. It was, was kind of like anime or a cartoon where you all did your lines separately and then met up, and then they just meshed everything together. Yeah, yeah, all the magic really happens in the in the editing room where the editor is in there by himself frantically trying to put this thing together before it puts on the television. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Um, so when did you hear about them wanting to make video games, and did they include you in, like, any of that process and, like, ask for your feedback on how they wanted to present Zordon? No, nobody ever asked me anything about how they wanted to present Zordon. Zordon... Uh, uh, on the original television show was basically just a a mouthpiece for certain exposition that they needed for the characters to know uh, to sort of like help them solve the monster of the week problem that they were facing. Um, the character of Zordon in the television show isn't a very deep character. There isn't a whole lot of information about his background or motivation um, because you have to remember the show was made for a certain age group. It wasn't made for uh, it wasn't made to be scrutinized in, in, a, in a way that uh, was able to sort of dissect how, how dramatic it was or how, how um, uh, complicated, you know, the, the stories lines were because they weren't, they weren't very complicated at all. Yeah. Um, so when it came to doing uh, video games, I was, I was never consulted about the character. Uh, and I was lucky enough that when um, Battle for the Grid came out, uh, Kyle Higgins uh, was tapped to sort of write the story portion of that game mm -hmm. because uh, it's it's like a fight it's like a, a side scroller fighting game like Streets of Fire or Mortal Kombat. Yeah, I, I watch my friends all the time stream that they enjoy that game a lot. Yeah, and so uh, they wanted to add a story component where people would go through missions and follow a story, and uh, Kyle was really sort of the uh, champion of trying to bring us back to voice the characters and stuff. So I did get a chance to come back and do the lines of Zordon then. And I also got to do the voice of the Cenozoic Blue Ranger. So I was actually a ranger in the game and nice. got to do the sounds of the kicks and punches and uh, the kias and stuff. So it's really cool. But um, all the other iterations of the ranger games that are out there, uh, nobody ever tapped me on the shoulder or anything like that now. So. Oh. Well, that would have been fun to see you actually be able to like at least do a couple lines, maybe. You never know, because I, I, when they make like a lot of the games back then, they always had some like side plan, and then you'll just see like there was the actor had recorded a bunch of stuff that they took out from the game because they couldn't fit it in, and I always ask like, did you silently do something on the side that you weren't allowed to talk about because of an NDA or anything like that back then that now's probably expired. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. I mean, nobody even like nobody from Bandai even contacted me when they did the communicator watch that people bought. Uh, they just hired somebody else to, uh, and and they tried their best to sort of match the vocal quality and. That the wasn't you. No, no, it wasn't me. So uh, I'm, I apologize to anybody who bought that and and thought that it was me. It it is so. Yeah. Well, at least you cleared it up now. <laughs> <laughs> So when they were making the movie, when did you find out about it? And did they give you a script? Like, uh, like what was the final, like, everything, how much changed from the script that you first saw when you were getting everything to you? 
Are you talking about the movie in 1995? Yeah, the, the very first original movie. Uh, well, I had left Los Angeles uh, shortly after the show had gone on the air. So I did the, they used my face throughout the life of the character, but I only provided the voice for Zordon for the first 31 episodes. And then I left uh, L.A. and I moved back to the East Coast and got involved in doing uh, voiceovers for radio and television commercials and video games. And uh, about a year later, uh, I did get one phone call about them wanting to know where I was and what my availability was because they were planning on doing a Power Rangers movie mm -hmm. and planning on filming it in L.A. at that time. Uh, but when they made the decision to film it in Australia uh, to save money, <laughs> because uh, cost is always an issue, uh, they completely re recast it. So I never saw a script. I never heard anything else. And uh, Nicholas Bell is the is the actor that plays Zordon in the movie, who's lying on the crystal bed there. Yeah. And uh, I believe Robert Manahan was still doing the voice of Zordon at that point. So uh, I think he was providing the the vocals for when you see Zordon in the power chamber before uh, Ivan you know, busts everything up. Uh, but uh, yeah, after that, I, I never heard anything, and then just sort of forgot about the show for a long time until Facebook came along. So. <laughs> So when you were starting out conventions, what made you want to start going to seeing everybody, and why do you still do conventions to this day? Um, well, uh, I when Facebook first arrived on the scene um, uh, around 2010, 2011, I would get uh, an odd message here and there from somebody I didn't know who was wanting to know if I was the actor who played Zordon on the Power Rangers. And of course, up to that point, uh, that little story was just a, a great little anecdote that I could tell people at parties. and like, yeah, yeah, I was on a kid's television show. And I really hadn't uh, paid much attention to it. And so uh, through the magic of the internet, I was able to figure out that, oh, wow, this show is still around. People still watch it. It's, it's still a big deal. And this was really sort of at the beginning of like this uh, nostalgia, uh, pop culture boom that, that was happening at the time where everything that people watched when they were kids was now becoming popular once again. And uh, so around 2011, I was contacted by um, the, uh, the owner of uh, uh, Tekka Shokan, which is uh, a, an anime convention in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is where I was living at the time. And they, he wanted to know if I would be willing to come in and, uh, uh, do a QA session and uh, meet meet some of the guests uh, or the the you know people that were coming to there. And I said, yeah, sure. I don't I don't know if the character is is that important or if people are even going to remember who Zordon is. And he was like, oh no, they know who you are. And I, I was like, okay, well, I I really had no idea what to expect. And that was the first time where I sat up on an on a stage in front of uh, an audience full of people and really understood how powerful that show was for a lot of people. And I, lo I heard a lot of stories about people who uh, were latchkey kids who would come home and their parents were still at work and they didn't have anything to do except uh, to have this show to watch that, that kept them grounded. Or they came from a broken home where they lived with one parent or the other and uh, they, they had a lot of sadness in their life. And the show was, it was a, a beacon for them to sort of latch onto and the character of Zordon really was someone that they looked up to to give them some advice about how to get through things. And because the the show was a very positive message type show, uh, they were always thanking me for, for being there for them. And uh, that was like the first time that I was really sort of blown away by how, uh, how many people had actually been touched by this little show that I did. And uh, it wasn't until 2014, three years later, where uh, I got invited to Power Morphicon for the first time, which was, is held every two years out in Pasadena, California. And Scott Zillner, who runs that show, had messaged me uh, saying, we would love to bring up, you know, uh, if you would come to Power Morphicon this year. And I said, I'd love to. I just don't know if I can afford to fly out there and put myself up in a hotel for three days. He goes, no, no, we'll take care of that. And that was sort of like my first sort of, oh, wow, uh, I, I'm kind of being treated different like, than... Like a, yeah, like... Yeah, I hate to use the word celebrity because I, I really don't think of myself as a celebrity. I, I, I considered myself to be 
extremely lucky uh, to be in the right place at the right time uh, to be a part of this thing that blew up. Uh, and um, it's, it's always a, a very humbling experience to be asked to go anywhere because um, I always felt that, that my contribution to the show seemed so small to me that I, that they only filmed me for one day and then that I would go in and do a few lines every five or six weeks. Uh, but not really sort of realizing the, the larger impact of all that stuff put together. And, uh, so, uh, that was the first year that I reconnected with Austin and David Yost and Walter Jones and a number of the other members of the cast and everybody remembered who I was. Uh, I didn't have to introduce myself to anybody. People, uh, came up to me to talk to me. And so it was, it was like being welcomed home, uh, with open arms. And that was like a really, really special feeling. So, uh, the reason I do conventions is to meet, uh, people that love the show, uh, that, uh, want to share their stories with me. And I, I do it because I want to thank them for, uh, allowing us to be a part of their childhood, for coming into their homes and just sort of like be able to give back something to them that they gave to all of us. So that, that's the reason that I do conventions. Nice. Um, if they were to ask for a reboot, would you go in and read a Zordon again? Uh, yeah, I would love to. Uh, I, I have no idea what Hasbro has uh, in mind for the future uh, for the franchise. I know that they're they're doing Dino Fury right now and in, in the middle of that. Um, so uh, I, I have no idea. But uh, if I had if I were to be asked, uh, sure, I would love to do that. Um, uh, the character has uh, a very special place in my heart and. Um, after reading all the stuff that Boom Comics did, what Kyle and Ryan Parrott and, and all the artists that worked on those books did and how they filled in a lot of the blanks for Zordon's background and, and why he does what he does, uh, it's, it's really great to see that uh, it, you know, the character is still very much alive and well <laughs> here in 2021. So yeah, if I was asked, of course I would go back. Yeah. Did they even ask you for the new movie? Did they talk to you oh. at all about, like, maybe? <laughs> no, uh, yeah. when, before they had announced Brian uh, Cranston as the role, people were asking me if I was going to go back and do the part. And um, knowing how uh, uh, Hollywood works and how uh, films get made based off of a certain um, uh, recognition factor that, that actors bring to the roles, I knew that they were not going to contact me at any point about any of that because... I, I was no longer involved in the Hollywood machine. I wasn't a name. I didn't have any sort of like experience or uh, a resume of parts that people could go, oh yeah, he was in this, so yeah, he could do that. Um, I understood how it worked. And I was very excited when they announced Brian as the part because that meant that my chances of meeting him jumped up 50% because- <laughs> there could be a commission with it. Yeah, yeah, there would be a commission we'd be able to meet. And Brian is awesome. And um, I know Brian did voices for some of the monsters on the show at the same time I did. And uh, so we, you know, we had that sort of like, we missed each other in the halls kind of moment. Um, but uh, uh, nah, you know, nobody ever contacted me about that. I never expected them to. And, and when I saw the movie in the theater, uh, it was very strange to be sitting there and hearing the name Zordon over and over and nobody was looking at me. So I mean, it was, it was very strange, but uh, I thought it was great. Yeah. How was it when, people found out about you being Zordon what was their reaction to like you just walking through the street what was it like first time somebody recognized you uh well outside of convention nobody recognizes me so uh it's kind of great to have that sort of anonymity where I can go where I want to and uh go into a restaurant and nobody recognizes me and and so that that's nice uh when I attended New York Comic Con a couple of years ago that was the only time that somebody actually yelled at me on the street and said, hey, it's Zordon. I'm like, how the heck do you know who I am? Uh, and, but uh, once they see me in the convention hall or walking uh, you know, through the, uh, the green room or the lunch space, that's when I get people calling my name and stuff. But other than that, nobody knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to take any more time. Uh, is there any projects that are coming up that you want everybody to know about? 
Sure. Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a writer these days, and I have a book series uh, called The Lincoln Bright Novels, which are out. The first one is called Glimms, and you can purchase that on Barnes & Noble and Amazon. Uh, the second uh, novel, Gaunts, uh, launches this July, and I am in the middle of writing the third book right now. Um, uh, I also have an author page up on Amazon.com. If you look, if you just type in my name, my author page should come up, and you can see uh, the other books that I've written and the uh, anthologies that I have stories in. Uh, but other than that, that's the only thing that I have going right now. So. I will put the links in the description, so check that out. Oh. Thank you so much, David, for spending a little bit of time with us. I know everybody appreciated you playing Zordon so openly and giving us all advice as children back in the day. So this is Linda. Thank you so much for watching. If you're new, please subscribe. And as always, keep on gaming. This is the podcast that is glitching out. Bye, everybody. Linda, the gamer girl. She's here, she's playing games. Linda, the gamer girl. She's here, she's playing games too.